mercy be with you today from Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, we're doing a sermon series, as you know, on wisdom. And so far we've talked about seeking wisdom with all of our heart. Uh, we've talked about the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom, speaking wise words. Last week we talked about hearing wisely. This week I'd like to talk with you about the wisdom of forgiveness. And that's such an important topic for us. I mean, it affects everything. It affects our freedom. It affects our joy and our peace. It affects our relationships with each other. And it affects our relationship with God. And so it's my delight to share with you today about forgiveness. And the question we ask is, to forgive or not to forgive? That is the question. And should we indeed forgive people even when they hurt us terribly? In life, let's see what God says to us about that today in His Holy Word. What can we say? Well, first off, uh, we can note this: that this topic applies to all of us and is very timely. Why? Because we've all been hurt, right? And we all continue to get hurt. And guess what? You're gonna continue in the future to be hurt in this world, in this life, right? And why is that? Well, I think the answer can quickly be found here in Matthew chapter 15, where Jesus says, For out of the heart, out of the human heart, come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a man. And so what do we see in the world coming out of people's hearts? We see those things, evil thoughts, murder, fornication, theft, adultery, slander, which means bad words towards one another. And such things. And so we see that everywhere in the world. It's like um, like what we saw in the days of Noah. Remember what it says in Genesis? It says, God looked on the, on the world. And he saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And God looked and the earth was filled with violence. And so this is so timely for us to talk about. Because you have been hurt. You are continuing at some points to be hurt. And you will be hurt at some point in the future. Maybe someone on the way home today will cut you off the road. And, uh, and you will be needing to practice this. And so let's talk today about um, forgiveness. What is to be our response when people hurt us? Is it to uh, settle accounts? Pay back. To get even? To hurt back? To uh, settle the score? Or is it to forgive and to set free? Well, what's our first response usually? <laughs> Heard back, right? I remember, in fact, um, when I was in high school, I think, in ninth grade, I was playing baseball, and um, and I don't know, for the, this guy on the other team, for some reason, decided to single me out as a person he hated, to Tommy, and uh, and uh, and he would stare at me, I think, during the game. But I remember getting on base one time. He was the first baseman, and he kind of shoved me and talked trash to me. And then in the lineup after the game, you know, the teams walk up and shake hands with each other. I remember looking at him coming down. Shaking hands, shook hands, shook hands, shook hands, got to me, and boom, pushed me. My first thought was not forgiveness. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't respond and push him back, but I'll tell you, that was the first thing that came to my head, into my mind. I wanted to push him back and just as aggressively or harder. And why is it? Why do we, why is that our first response? When someone hurts you, that your first response is to hurt back, even even in a relationship with someone you love, if they hurt you, your first response a lot of times is to hurt back. Well, I believe it's because uh, we have a sense of God's justice written into our very hearts, God's law. In fact, check this out. Leviticus 24. Here's God's justice, okay? Verse 11, 17 and follow. He who kills a man shall be put to death. He who kills, uh, he who kills a beast shall make it good, life for life. When a man causes a disfigurement in his neighbor, as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he's disfigured a man, he shall be disfigured. So, isn't that how we feel? I mean, that is, God's justice is perfect. And I'll tell you, God does bring a man's deeds back upon his own head. Uh, and that sort of justice, I believe, is written into our hearts. In fact... Paul says of the Gentiles in Romans chapter 2 that the law of God is written upon their hearts. And you can see this even, um, even if you go to an ele elementary school, right? You see little toddlers playing. Is their first response to forgive when they get hit? You get hit, you hit back, right? 
If you get, in fact, I've even seen it, I think, once here in our nursery, which is a very safe place, by the way. <laughs> You're ever wondering, but I do believe, I think I saw or heard once, someone took something in there and bumped another little toddler on the head, and the other toddler's first response was to want to bump the person back. Right? Insult for insult, and, uh, and such things. And you see it amongst toddlers, even, that they have a sense of justice, a sense of payback, a first response of revenge. If you ever try to give uh, one kid a piece of candy and not the others, what do they cry? But that's not fair, because kids have a sense of justice. Everything has to be even with them, even Stephen. And uh, so if children have a sense of abundance, of, uh, of uh, justice, so too it is with adults. The only difference between toddlers and us is that we're most subtle in the way we would seek to get revenge. Uh, not quite as obvious to get even. And so the law of God is written in our hearts. And so our first response when we get hit instantly, naturally, is to want to hit back. To settle accounts. To even the score. Eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. Insult for insult. But I ask, what about forgiveness? Is it wiser to forgive, or is it wiser to even the score and take revenge? Well, I know what the world would say to that. They'd say to get even and take revenge. Um, now, I know some people in the world will agree and know that forgiveness is good, but I'll tell you, I can know them by their deeds and by what they'll do. Most people, they want to get back. In fact, I met a man once um, who was getting divorced, or who was divorced from his wife. And I was trying to bring him to Christ and witness to him and bring him salvation. And, um, and uh, he talked about his wife and how he hated her. And I said, you need to forgive her because unless you forgive her, God won't forgive you. Which is in the Bible, right? And, um, and he was like, <laughs> he laughed. He kind of uh, grinned at that. And he says, I'll never do that. He says, during our divorce, I got angry. I got rageful. And that revenge gave me power, great power. I'll never let go of that rage because it gives me strength. That was his answer. And I tried to witness. He wasn't hearing any. And I thought to myself, well, okay then. And I didn't say this out loud, but here's a man heading for disaster, destruction, and death. Right? Because where does, where does revenge take you? Where does getting payback take you? It always escalates and escalates. You pay back, they pay back to you. And it ultimately ends in death. Think about, for example, um, in the Bible. Joab, you remember him? He was uh, the commander of David's army. And early in his life, um, he was on one side with David's men. David wasn't there. And then David's enemies were on the other side of this pool in the wilderness. Abner was on the opposing side. And uh, Joab had a brother, Asahel, who pursued after Abner. And he ran after him to kill him. And Abner turns around and says, Why are you pursuing me, Asahel? Uh, oh, I'm going to strike you down. If I did that, how would I look upon your brother Joab? But Asahel continued to pursue, and Abner turned around and smote him in the belly and killed him. Well, Joab tried to pursue and avenge his brother's death, but he didn't catch Abner. And so the years passed and rolled over and over, and there was great war for years. And there was no resolution for Joab, and it went on and on and on until Abner one day decided to come and make peace with David and bring over all Israel to David's side. David agrees and sends him out under a protection of security. And Joab, though, goes out with treachery in his heart. And he says, Abner, turn aside here. David has another message for you. And he turns over and he, <clears throat> right into his gut, twists the dagger, and Abner dies. When he died, David said this. He said, uh, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord for the blood of Abner. He was angry at Joab. May it fall upon the head of Joab and upon all his father's house. So Joab didn't let go of revenge. And he saw it through to the end and killed Abner. And guess what happened was the end of Joab's life. He died clasping the horns of the altar, basically begging for mercy when Benaiah came and avenged and he was killed. I'll tell you what, if you have hurt and harboring anger against someone in your life today and you're not letting go of your grudge, you're going to end the same way as Joab did, without mercy, because he showed, showed no mercy. And uh, such ends all the stories of revenge. Think about um, that adage, that proverb, uh, before you take revenge, start by taking, digging two graves. Now that is a proverb I didn't get from the Bible. It actually came from a James Bond movie. Yes, I get 
my proverbs from the James Bond movie. But <laughs> before you take revenge, start by digging two graves. One for the one you're going to slay, and one for yourself, because that revenge will come around and kill you, too, in the end. Does the world listen to this kind of wisdom? The world says, no, it's a spat for a spat, an insult for an insult, insult, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. And what does the world call revenge? Sweet, right? Oh, how sweet it is. Sweet revenge, it tastes so wonderful. Well, I'll tell you, that is a, that is a deathly uh, path to, to, to walk. And I want to ask, how about you, though? Which will you choose today? Or is there anybody in your life, in your past, who's hurt you, for whom you're still harboring hurt against them in your heart, that you would seek payback and to seek them to be hurt? Do you have any grudges in your life today? Just take a moment and think about that. What will the Holy Spirit reveal to you? Do you refuse to forgive? Well, to forgive or not to forgive. That's our question today, right? What does God say to us? With respect to this question, he says clearly and categorically, forgive. I want you to forgive, and indeed you must forgive. For he's, I speak this with the voice of a command, forgive. Did you hear that word from God today? He commands it. You say, really, Lord, really? I mean, forgive those people. Do you know what they did to me? That really, really, really hurt. And uh, that's, a, that's something that I just can't pass over easily. But let me give you some reasons now from the scriptures which God gives you, by His Holy Spirit, of increasing order of intensity, why we are to forgive. Number one, you ready? Let's turn to Proverbs 19. This is actually a proverb in the Bible, by the way, not one I got from a movie. Verse 11, the Holy Spirit says, Good sense makes a man slow to anger, and it's his glory to pass over an offense. Think about that. Good sense makes a man slow to anger, and it's his glory to pass over an offense. And so... One reason you should forgive is for the sake of your own glory, your own credit, your own honor. For I ask you this, which is easier to forgive or not to forgive? That is, seek it and settle an account and take revenge. I'll tell you what, any toddler in any little play school romper room knows how to take revenge. And if you want to take revenge, how are you better than any gang member in the ghetto, any vile, wretched sinner can take revenge? Listen to what Jesus says in Luke 6. He says, If you only love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Right? I mean, if you do not forgive today, whatever you're harboring in your heart against another, how are you better than Al Capone and the, and the Godfather and the Mafia if you don't forgive? For they also do good to those who do good to them. They also kill those who are across to them. You know, if you want to make a little deal with me, you're going to have a very sweet, well, sweet to see old deal here. You cross me, you're going to end up in the river, right? I mean, Al Capone knows how to do that. Will that make you and set you aside as a prince of heaven if you take revenge? It will not. The Bible says it's the glory of a man to overlook an offense to your credit and to your honor. It takes greater inner strength. So do it for the sake of honor and glory. Secondly, you can do it for the sake of love and the sake of your neighbor. For Think about it. What, what breaks relationships up? What breaks a, a, a husband and a wife up? What breaks up our relationship with God? Or friends to friends? What's it called? You know it? Sin. Right? But God says in the Bible of our relationship with Him, Isaiah 59, verse 1 and following, Behold, the Lord's hand isn't shortened that it cannot save nor is his ear dull that it can't hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you so that he does not hear. What is it that separates people from people and people from God? Sin. What's the one thing that can bring those two back together again? One thing and one thing only? Forgiveness. There's nothing else that can do it. No good deed is going to bring those two back together. It's only forgiveness that can reconcile and bring two that have been broken apart back together again. Nothing else can do it. If you want to picture sin like a snake, like a pit viper, like a poisonous, venomous serpent, it comes and bites you, bites your relationship, bites your heart. Well, it's already got its venom in you. It's coursing through your veins. It's heading to your heart. It's about to kill you. And there's only one antidote that God has given, and that is forgiveness. 
How will you ever be free to enjoy your wife again as a husband? Or your wife, how you enjoy your husband and fellowship him with him again unless you forgive? How will a friend enjoy a friend again when they sin unless they forgive? How can a, a neighbor, a neighbor, or even a person, his enemy, come to fellowship again except by forgiveness? It's the only way, God says. And therefore, for love's sake and for your neighbor's sake and for the relationship's sake, forgive. For Proverbs 17 says, He who forgives an offense seeks love. But he who repeats a matter alienates a friend. But you say, uh, okay, pastor, well, well, what, if, what if I forgive them and I want to do this, but they don't want anything to do with it. They scorn my forgiveness. They don't want reconciliation. They won't admit to having done wrong. Well, then I say, okay, then. You can't control that. But you've done at least your part. And that's good. Because it may lead to a new relationship with that other person, or it may not. But I'll tell you one thing, and here's the next point. At least it'll set you free and heal you. So do it for your own freedom's sake as well. Because you ever hear that story of the, uh, the monkey that was how they catch monkeys in Africa? Um, where they have a bag up in the tree and just the bag has a hole opening about this much with a ring. Um, some sort of metal ring. And then a monkey can stick his hand in to get the fruit, let's say an apple. And he can grab that apple. But then uh, his hand is now too big with holding the apple to get his hand out. So he pulls, and he pulls, and he pulls, and he can't get free. The, the hunter comes along and kills the monkey. You know the funny thing about that story? Is that that monkey could be free at any time. If he just let go of the apple, he could get out and escape. But because he's not willing to let, hold, let go of the hole he has on the monkey, he's killed. And that's the same way it is when we hold a grudge against uh, the hurt that someone else has done to us. As long as we hold on to that, we are... We are uh, trapped and will be killed for it. But you can just let it go and be free. Forgiveness sets you free. For if there is a poison in your heart, if there's gangrene and it's eating you alive, this is the antidote. Joab in the Bible, remember, he never let go of revenge and it killed him in the end. Revenge comes around to kill without mercy. And uh, what does it mean to forgive in the Bible? Well, the, the word there, there's two words. Let's do the first one. When Jesus says, forgive and you'll be forgiven, he uses the word apaluo. Now that's not like luau, like Hawaii. This is luo, apaluo, say it, apaluo. That's a Greek word that means to loose the person, to unbind him, to release him, to let him go free, to set him at liberty, to set them free. It means you don't exact justice against them. Now, whenever someone hurts you, they are in debt to you because justice needs to be served. But forgiveness, apoluo, means to let it go. Don't exact the toll. Let that person go free. Let him escape. There's another word that God uses, Jesus uses in Matthew 6. Uh, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. That word is afiemi. Can you try that one? Afiemi in the Greek. Which means let the good person go out of your power. Let the person go free. Let him escape. It doesn't mean that that person does not deserve justice, okay? And it doesn't mean that the person is getting an escaping justice. It means he is, you are letting him go free or her go free from you. Can you do that today? What are you holding on to? What apple? What grudge? Is there any in there? Let the person go. Because in their freedom, you will find your freedom. That doesn't mean they won't be judged by God. Vengeance belongs to him. It doesn't belong to us. Let justice go and practice mercy. <coughs> Which leads us to a... And even more intense reason, this is my fourth reason, is because God forgave you in Christ. We are to forgive. Think about that. That's the whole thing we're about as Christians. Paul says in Ephesians 1, in Christ Jesus, in Jesus you, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. He bought your forgiveness at a great price. His own blood. And the gospel is all about forgiveness. And Jesus said, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise, and that repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be preached in His name to all nations. You know, grace begins with God and comes to us, but then it comes to us, to other people. Forgive because He's forgiven you. Paul says in Colossians 3.13, As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. If you would be free, you must forgive. There's no freedom apart from it. And He forgave us that we might forgive. 
So you do it for your own credit's sake and honor's sake, for love's sake of your neighbor. You do it for the sake of your freedom. You do it for Christ's sake because he got forgive you such a great debt. Adultery and, and the robbery and blasphemy and a thousand others that we've done in our hearts, if not else in our bodies. Can you not forgive your debt, his neighbor, his little debts to you? And Jesus actually told a parable. Do you know that about this? And about the consequences if you choose not to forgive, which leads to our next <laughs> intense point. All right. Matthew 18, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man, to a king, who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began the reckoning, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, which is like, let's say, a billion dollars. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. That's justice, right? Payback. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Lord, have patience with me, and I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that servant released him and forgave the debt. He passed by justice, didn't exact the toll, and forgave him, right? And that same servant, as he went out, came to one of his fellow servants, who owed him just a hundred denarii. That's like, let's say, 20 bucks. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and besought him, Oh, have patience with me, and I'll pay you. But he refused and went and put him in prison so he should pay the debt. Now, when his fellow servants uh, saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went to the king and reported all that had taken place. And the Lord summoned the wicked servant and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you besought me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Watch this. And in anger... The king, he, his lord, delivered him to the jailers till he should pay all his debt. And Jesus concludes it like this. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Woo! That is serious, isn't it? If you do not forgive your brother from your heart, Jesus says God will hand you over to the jailers. Now, who are the jailers? The jailers there, that's not the best translation of the word. The word is basanestes in the Greek, which means tormentors, torturers, as they had in prison in those days. People who would torture you to extract information. You think that's what God will do? That's what Jesus says will happen if you do not forgive your brother after he's forgiven you. So God is serious because he wants your freedom. That's why he's so serious about this. And who, are the, who are the tormentors? Who are the jailers in this case, the boss and the states? Well, maybe God will turn you over to your enemies, right? But then again, on the other hand, I know people who haven't forgiven people, and they weren't really turned over to their enemies. They're still... How about uh, the divorced man that was angry at his wife? Could it be um, that God turns you over to your conscience? Maybe a tormented conscience. When you don't forgive someone, your conscience is tormented. Well, our consciences are tormented if we're Christians, right? If we don't forgive. But guess what else? I know a guy, that same guy, he didn't forgive the other person, and he had no kinds of conscience. He was happy at not forgiving. Could it be that it means here the tormentors are demons? Yes, I would tell you, demons. And more than demons, you're opening the door to Satan in your life if you do not forgive. Second Corinthians 2, Paul says, What I've forgiven, if I've forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ to keep Satan from gaining the advantage over us, for we're not ignorant of his designs, of his strategies and his schemes. So what's he saying there? If we don't forgive and we have unforgiveness in our hearts, you're actually, it's like that door over there. Opens up, and guess what? If you have a door in the, minute, in the, in the inner city, and you leave it open long enough, you're going to get robbers coming in, aren't you? It says in Ephesians 4, Paul says, Be angry, but don't sin. And don't let your sun go down in your anger. And give no place to the devil. The word place there is location or or an entryway, um, it can be, I heard, translated a port or a harbor. He's like a ship sailing out there trying to get into your life. If you don't forgive and you hold on to grudges and you will, you will refuse to show mercy to others after you receive mercy, you're opening a door. And he's going to come in an anchor in your life and cause all kinds of havoc and torment. So thus says God. Thus says Jesus. If he, he says... Um, James, or sorry, Matthew 6 if you, this is Jesus if you forgive men their trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly father forgive your trespasses that's serious, right? and so, 
for your own credit's sake, right, for honor, for your neighbor's sake, for freedom's sake, for Christ's sake, forgive, and also for the sake of your relationship with God and to keep Satan from getting any place in you, to, to wreak havoc. You don't want that, I don't want that. But you know the wonderful word is? When we forgive, guess what? You're also opening a door. You're opening the door to the Holy Spirit to work wonders in your life. And why is God so serious about forgiveness? You know why? I'll tell you in a word. Freedom. He wants you free. And that's the only way. He knows, for, and forgiveness delights him. Jesus says to, to the Jews of his day, If you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. God delights in mercy. He, he loves it. And he wants you to practice the same thing. Remember, grace starts with God and comes to us, forgiving us in Christ. But it doesn't end there. It continues through us to others. Practice and extend forgiveness and grace to other people. That's God's will. Because he delights in forgiveness. And he is a good and loving God and he wants your freedom. And so, how many times though? <laughs> someone sins against you, how many times should you forgive him? Peter asked that as many as seven times. He keeps hurting me, Lord. Jesus says, I tell you not seven, but as 70 times seven. Which is a way of saying always forgive. Because God never wants you bound up. He wants you free. Every sin, Lord? Every sin? Yes. Every sin. Does that mean that um, the guy who hurt me, though, is getting off scot-free if I do this? No. You know what it means when you forgive? It means you're getting off scot-free. It means you're getting freedom. And the hope of God and yours is that maybe you forgiving the other person might just open the door for the relationship to be healed. And that person might get saved. And all might be well. And that's God's desire. But even if not, and you forgive and they refuse to repent, then justice will be served. But Paul And Paul says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Never. But leave it to the wrath of God. For it's written, Vengeance is mine. I'll repay, says the Lord. You know what? Vengeance, payback, belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us. And guess what? He's going to do it a whole lot better than you would anyway. But his hope is that forgiveness would open a door to their salvation too. But at the very least, it sets you free. You want to be free today? Let it go. Remember the Frozen song? Let it go, let it go. Well, let it go. Right now, let it go. Forgive that person. Right before God, right this instant, let it go. Set them free. Let them escape. Don't exact the toll. Let them be free. And you be free. So how can you then forgive? When it's hard. When the person's really, really, really hurt you. The only way I know to do it is this, and it's from the Bible, Colossians 3.13 again. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And so whenever someone's hurt you terribly, just think about it this way. How have I hurt God in the same way? But this person lied to me, Lord. Well, haven't we lied to God and used our tongues falsely? And he forgave you. But, 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 but this person stole from me, Lord. He deserved. Well, haven't we stolen from God and he forgave you? Well, but, but he betrayed. We betrayed Christ and he forgave us. But, but this person even killed one of my own family members. Well, guess what? Our sins, I'll put Jesus on the cross. We killed him. For it's written, he died for our sins and he forgave us even then. Should we not then practice the same forgiveness with them? For we're just having mortals sin against us. But we've sinned against the holy, eternal God, the Holy One of Israel, which is an eternal sin... I mean, an eternal uh, offense if it's not dismissed. And God dismissed it. Because He loves you and He delights in your freedom. Can, if God gave you a billion dollar debt to Him, can we not forgive our neighbors or even our enemies their small debts to us? Great toward it for us, but small by comparison to what God forgave us in Christ. And uh, finally, I'll just say this, is that, do you know what? From before the foundation of the world, God predestined you to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And what is the image of Jesus Christ? What is Jesus Christ? King Manasseh sinned in the Old Testament. This guy practiced witchcraft and burned his sons as a sacrifice to demons. He repented and Christ forgave him. David committed adultery and murder and Christ forgave him. Rahab committed harlotry. Noah was a, I'm sorry, Noah was a drunk. Peter denied Christ. 
Paul ravaged the church, and God forgave them all and set them free. And Jesus on the cross died saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. If Christ then so let you and me go free, not exacting justice against us on a toll, should we not then let our fellow man go free, for Christ's sake and for our own freedom. In Jesus' name, amen.